Hello, this is Jonas from VHDLWiz. In this video, I want to talk about how to implement the classic snake game on an FPGA. I did that just recently. I'm going to outline the main steps in doing so in this video. I also created a course which shows how to do it in great detail, which I will link to from below the video. I used the Digilent RT7 board for that with the Xilinx AMD FPGA. You can probably use any board but it's even easier if it has a PMOD connector because then you can plug the PMOD display that I'm using directly into the board and then just use some click buttons on the board to control the snake. So this is the board we used, the tiny 128x32 pixel monochrome display. It's the PMOD OLED display from Digilent. And the first step in creating this snake game is to control the display and that's actually a project on its own because it involves using SPI, the serial peripheral interface, to communicate with the graphics controller on this display. But I had a separate course about that in the VHDLS membership, how to control the PMOD OLED display. So I just used the final code from that as the starting point for the snake game. But the addressing of the pixels was not optimal for implementing the snake game because I was addressing pixels in columns of 8 pixels. It was byte addressing of the pixels. But when implementing the snake game, the snake can move in either direction and we have to have detailed control of each pixel. So we had to create an additional pixel writer module on top of that to control any pixels so that we could set the column address and the row address on the interface and then set should this pixel be illuminated or not, turn on or off a pixel. And when we had this additional pixel writer module, we could create a more efficient test bench because then all of the communication with the display goes through a specific pixel writer interface with only four signals, column, row, and write enable, and the value on or off. So what we did was to create a custom graphical user interface. We used Questa's foreign language interface API to connect this Python graphical user interface that we created through a C program. I'm showing how to do it in the course. And this has the added benefit that we don't have to implement any changes on the board until we are finished because we can test the entire game controller in the simulator and we can interact with the simulation, just play the game in this GUI while the VHDL code that we are debugging is running and doing the work. So we can simulate the gameplay in Questa in real time and interact with it using this button click interface. So the first step in implementing the snake game is to implement the movement so that when you click a button, the snake moves. So that's what we did. We implemented the movement by moving the head around and when it moved, we would illuminate pixels where it moved. But then the snake just grew and grew and it didn't do anything else. So we had to implement tracking of the, s the uh, snake's tail so that we could erase the tail pixels when the snake got long enough. And to do that, in software, I would just put the coordinates of the snake in the FIFO and erase the oldest parts of the FIFO. It's a bit more complicated in VHDL, but since in the VHDL's membership, I have two hardware FIFOs that we can use that use block RAM. I picked one of them and we instantiated it in our design and we used it to put the head coordinates of the snake. And when the snake grew long enough, we uh, we used the output from the FIFO to erase the pixel so that the snake would move around and not just become longer and longer. But everyone who has placed, played the snake knows that if the snake runs into itself, it should be game over because the snake cannot eat itself. So I had to implement that some way and then we had to use another block RAM. I used an existing block RAM template from the VHDLS membership to implement a single port block RAM that we could use to look up any pixel on the display to check if it was part of the snake from before. So anytime the head moves, we have to put the new coordinate in the tail tracking FIFO, but also in the block RAM so that we can check later is the new head coordinate part of the tail. And then we have to er erase 
these coordinates from the block RAM as the snake moves. So we did that in the course. And then we could move the snake around and if we ran into ourselves or if we ran into the border of the display, it was game over. But there was no point to the game because there was no food, like the dots that the snake is supposed to eat. And we implemented that by having, uh, well, some signals that said where the dot is and if it was, was visible, if the food was visible, so that when the head moved across and hit the food, it would grow. We just set the length of the snake, the signal that sets the length of the snake, we increased it so that the ring buffer FIFO would store more pixels and the snake would become longer on the display. But we had to implement some kind of randomness because there's no randomness in FPGAs. So we used the button inputs, the, uh, the sequence of button inputs to, um, to make the game more random because, th as you know, there's no randomness in the FPGA, but the button clicks, the user input is kind of random. And then finally, we had to have a nice game over screen, so we created one using ASCII art, and then when the game controller said it's game over, we just switched screens, because we can store many uh, frames in, in the uh, OLED controller module, so we just switched to show another frame that had a nice game over screen. And we ran into some other issues that we solve in the course, like clearing the block RAM after reset and so on. Things that you don't have to think about if you're using software. Now, the end product itself, the actual snake game, isn't that impressive, because we have all seen these kind of games using Arduinos and such, but implementing it in hardware is much more challenging. And by using the methods that I'm showing in the course, you will learn things that you can use in other more serious VHDL projects. For example, if you have projects that require a lot of user input, or if you have projects that are visual, like image processing, it may not be enough to have a traditional test bench, like an, a test bench that shows signals and printouts like waveforms. You may also have to use some kind of graphical user interface or a way to visualize the results as they are running in the Questa simulator. And you can use what I'm teaching in this course for that too. So you can use what you're learning in the new course in a lot of different FPGA projects. Okay, thank you for watching. And if you want to know more about the new course, just click the link below the video and get to the page where you can see the outline of the course and join the course and the VHDOS membership. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.